trying to work on two screens right now. Okay, so um, thanks for coming into class today, guys. This is kind of a special occasion. Uh, we're going to be joined by uh, Senator Romney, who kind of really just wanted to really talk to you guys to see how things are going really at Harriman High, uh, and maybe have you guys ask him some questions about like some of the, uh, the different uh, job responsibilities that he has. Um, so, Senator Romney, if you want to maybe give us a brief introduction. Okay, well, just a couple things. First, uh, I wish I had better news for you. Uh, obviously, you guys are uh, in kind of a isolation mode, unable to go to school, unable to go to your prom, unable to participate in sports. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, you can't get together with classmates and discuss what's going on. Uh, and prepare for for college. So I uh, I know it's tough, and uh, I wish I wish things were better for you. Uh, you should know that that same thing is going on across the country. Uh, people are really feeling uh, uh, the the difficulty of not being able to to get out and get out and about. Um, so our uh, our thoughts are with you, and I uh, hope you do very well and you keep safe and keep and keep healthy during this process. I thought I'd make a couple of comments about uh, COVID-19 before we uh, kick off here, because you'll probably want to ask broader questions than just that. But I think it's fair to say that that government at the federal level uh, has kind of failed uh, our country. And I'm not talking about just the current administration. I'm talking about Congress and administrations of the past, um, because uh, other countries uh, prepared for a pandemic. Uh, countries, particularly in, in Asia that had experienced SARS, another uh, epidemic in the past, uh, they had seen what it had happened then. They prepared so that in case a new pandemic came along, they would be able to respond immediately and effectively. And just to give you a sense of that, South Korea, which really was well prepared for this, based upon what we understand, in February, on February 20th, uh, they and we, neither one had any deaths from, from uh, COVID-19. On March 20th, they had 100 deaths from COVID-19. We had 150. On April 20th, they had 256 deaths from COVID-19, and we had 40,000 deaths. So what accounts for such a huge disparity? Well, they had already put in place the kind of testing protocols that, boy, we even today are having a hard time putting in place. They had uh, contact tracing going on where they could follow anybody who tested positive, get those individuals they'd been in touch with also tested. And then anyone who tested positive, they put them in quarantine. These kinds of procedures are the kinds of, uh, of protocols you normally follow anytime there's an epidemic or a pandemic of some kind. They were ready with that to go. We, on the other hand, I think for, I don't know how many years, a decade or longer, have said, well, these things don't come to the US, they just stay overseas. Well, finally, one came to the US. And, uh, and we just weren't as prepared as we should have been. And we're struggling even now to get up to the, uh, the level we should. I should note with, with some pride that Utah, uh, unlike the rest of the country, has done a pretty darn good job. I shouldn't say unlike the rest of the country, but better than the rest of the country. Uh, Utah has had less of an economic hit so far. Our unemployment rate is much, much better than the nation as a whole. We're among the top three states in terms of the number of tests per person that are done. And, uh, and the number of positive uh, results, meaning people that have COVID-19 at the test taken, is one of the lowest in the nation. So people are uh, doing what's necessary with social distancing and caring for uh, every procedure they can carry out to reduce the risk of COVID-19. So our, our state's doing very well. Uh, Governor Herbert, Lieutenant Governor Cox, the whole, the whole team have really been on top of this. Uh, but overall, the federal government has probably uh, let a few things slide, and not just in the last year or two, but I mean over the last decade or two. So we've got some learning to do, and hopefully we'll get a lot better as we confront the challenges that, we, uh, that we're gonna face here immediately and down the road. And with that, Mr. Jensen, I'll turn back to you for any questions you may have. Okay, so uh, Senator Romney, um, kind of maybe like we've been really going over uh, the you know the the three branches of government and really understanding what senators and and the executive branch and what Congress really does. So maybe kind of explain to you know the students what are some of your responsibilities as senator for Utah. Well, first of all, every senator uh, swears an oath to defend the Constitution, and that means our responsibility is protect the life and the liberty and the property of all of our citizens. 
and by property that really encompasses, if you will, our economy. It, it is our job to make sure that people are able to get good jobs and be able to pay, uh, get paid a, a living wage. And I mean, all these things are part of, if you will, the, the term property. So protecting life, liberty, and, and property. And as a senator, I really have sort of two jobs as it relates to that overall responsibility. One relates to the nation as a whole, which is my job is to make sure that the country has a strong national defense, that we have economic policies in place that encourage the growth of our total economy, uh, that uh, uh, we likewise protect the liberties that exist through our country and that we do through our, our institutions like the FBI and, and the Justice Department and our courts and so forth. All those things I'm, are responsible for at the federal level. But at the state level, uh, my responsibility is more narrowly focused on particular issues that relate to Utah and Utahns. Uh, so for instance, I have a great deal of concern about what's happening at Hill Air Force Base and want to make sure that in the competition uh, to decide who's going to be developing the new technologies to protect our country from nuclear assault, uh, I want to make sure that the, uh, the, the program is managed out of Hill Air Force Base, not somewhere else. So I work to foster the improvements for, for Hill. Likewise, when it comes to agriculture, uh, one of the issues that uh, you're probably familiar with is the fact that in Utah, we have a lot of horses and burros on our, our grazing lands. They're tearing up our grazing land. This isn't something that's a big issue uh, in Connecticut, but it's a big issue in Utah. Uh, so I work with other members of the Senate to say, look, I want you to put some money in our appropriations bills to make sure that we can manage the herd of of, uh, of wild horses and burros in a way that's effective. So there are issues that are specific to Utah I take responsibility for. And then there's some issues that are of a national uh, nature that obviously affect Utah as well as the whole country. Awesome, awesome. So what is a, a day in your life look like? Like what, I mean, what does your schedule look like on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, well, I get up pretty early and, uh, and I go into the, the Senate gym Believe it or not, in the United States Senate, there's a little gym where we have uh, exercise bikes, treadmills, and even a little mini swimming pool that uh, people can swim in. I've never been in that little pool, but I, I do get on the exercise bike at the treadmill. Uh, so I'm there at 5.30 or 6 in the morning. Uh, and then at 7 or 7.30, I'm back in my office and I begin by opening up all the emails and texts that I've received overnight with requests from people in Utah, from people across the country with uh, some articles uh, and, uh, and position papers and, and uh, studies that have been put together by members of my staff. And then, uh, then we get going usually about 8.30 with a meeting of my senior staff. Now, when I say staff, you have to recognize that every senator has a, a team. Uh, my team is about 25 people. About 10 of them are in Utah and about 15 are in Washington, D.C. The 10 that are in Utah are responsible for understanding precisely what the needs of Utah citizens are. It may be helping a constituent get some veterans benefits that they're entitled to that they haven't received. It may be instead uh, understanding what's happening uh, on the Green River and, uh, and what we have to do to get additional recreation areas on the Green River. So understanding issues in Utah and helping our constituents. That's the team in Utah. Then in Washington, D.C., my team is responsible for thinking about policies that I want, might want to promote, uh, legislation that I might want to vote for or against. Uh, individuals that are up for confirmation, either to a court or to the administration that I might want to vote for or against. And so uh, my senior staff comes together. That's the top four or five people. They come together in the morning. We spend about an hour going through all the issues that I'm going to face during the day. Then the next hour brings together all of my senior policy people. So perhaps uh, 10 people come together to talk about all the policies that we're working on, from how to manage the budget, how to, how to manage environmental issues, uh, to specific issues relating to Utah. So we'll talk through uh, perhaps for about 45 minutes or an hour, all the policy issues we're dealing with. And then after that begins a whole array of meetings, either with other senators to talk about policies that we share concern about, or uh, uh, individuals from Utah, citizens from Utah that come in, usually citizens that represent a group, perhaps a, a school or a university, uh, or a, uh, a union or a, a business or a type of uh, industry. They'll want to come in and talk about a particular concern that they have. Uh, I'll bring in with me a, one of my policy people responsible for that area to listen to what they have to say. 
Uh, then we have a meeting with all the Republican senators. Every day around noon, we get together for a good hour to talk about what each of us is working on and our concerns for the day. Uh, we have votes on the floor of the Senate uh, and perhaps a speech or two to give on the floor of the Senate to express our view on a, on a topic. Then more meetings, so lots of meetings, and then hearings. Uh, I'm on four committees, and each one of our committees is responsible for an area of our overall uh, national endeavor. Uh, so I'm on the Foreign Relations Committee. So we might have a committee meeting to talk about the developments uh, in, uh, in Pakistan, for instance, and, uh, and something that's happening there that might affect us. Uh, that, I'm also on the Small Business Committee. So we might get together for a hearing, listening to individuals with expertise in small business about a particular policy that we're considering. Uh, I'm also on the, uh, a committee that relates to homeland security and government oversight. Uh, and again, we can have hearings on, on that committee. So th these are the types of things that um, uh, occupy the day and pretty much goes like that until the very end of the day, uh, at which point perhaps there's a reception or a dinner uh, with, uh, with individuals in our state or with other senators. So it's a pretty full day. Uh, and, uh, and then I hope to get back to Utah on the weekend, uh, uh, maybe Friday, Saturday, Sunday, one to spend time with my family, but also to be able to spend time with uh, individuals in Utah that have uh, specific concerns they want to talk to me about. So that's kind of a typical schedule. Long answer, Mr. Jensen. Yeah, it sounds like a, a pretty busy day, you know, all around. Um, so really, how has your responsibilities changed since the, you know, uh, COVID-19 epidemic? Well, now that we're all uh, remote, uh, basically living in our respective homes and only getting together by, by Zoom or by Google Meet, um, we're finding it much more difficult to have our normal hearings. So hearings are pretty much stopped altogether. Uh, meetings with Utah individuals are done more now by text and email than they are in person. Uh, the, uh, the constituent services work continues full speed ahead. And my team members are working for their homes to help individuals across the state with, uh, with their particular needs. Um, but, uh, but I get together with my senior staff uh, every morning I uh, get together with my policy staff and foreign relations team again uh, on a regular schedule. So we keep we keep meeting um, either on, on on one of these uh, video sites or sometimes just by telephone because that's uh, that's a little easier. And I don't have to dress up for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so we, keep, we keep that going. And then other senators I'm in touch with, again, typically by uh, by email or text. Uh, and but everything in this last uh, couple of months has been focused on how to deal with COVID-19. Basically all the other major policy things that we've been working on have taken a bit of a back burner. They're not gone entirely, but they've slowed down a bit. And instead the focus is pretty exclusively on, uh, on how we deal with COVID-19. And, and the area that's really taken most of our time in the Senate has been how, how we help individual families and small businesses and big businesses for that matter during this uh, during this crisis, because it's not only an, an economic challenge, but also excuse me, not only a health challenge, but an economic challenge as well. And uh, and so finding ways to help out small businesses, employees, families has been a high priority. So you probably know uh, we passed a piece of legislation that provides a check to every adult uh, in our society of one thousand two hundred dollars. Um, at the same time, we uh, provided legislation that provides loans, forgivable loans to small businesses so that they can maintain their, their payroll, their employees. Uh, there's also provision to help larger businesses. They can get loans they are not forgivable, but they can get loans that they can apply for from, uh, from their bank or from the Federal Reserve uh, to be able to, uh, to stay in business and to keep their, their operations running uh, during what is a difficult time. So and right now, actually, even today, we're expecting potentially a vote on another measure to provide additional funding uh, to keep uh, keep people in uh, in their jobs. So that's that's the focus these days. OK, awesome. So I guess uh, we'll really just open it up for maybe like student questions, uh, you know, at this time. Um, one of the questions that I had come in, I, I don't see or hear uh, was from Lauren Social. Uh, and it says, what is your number one priority to accomplish while serving, you know, in the Senate? Uh, it's really hard for me to pick just one thing. So I'll tell you uh, uh, two or three things that I'll put at the top of the list. Uh, I, I want to make sure 
to the extent humanly possible that we finally come to grips with the excessive spending in Washington. Uh, we spend a little over $4 trillion a year and uh, we receive revenue of about three trillion a year. So we're short about one trillion every year, even in good times. This is before COVID-19. So we add a trillion dollars to the debt every year. And, and we had 22 trillion in debt even before COVID-19 came around. And, uh, and in my opinion, that's just wrong that during good economic times, during superb economic times, we're still spending massively more than we're taking in. So I'm trying to get Congress to finally come to grips with this. And I've got a proposal called the Trust Act, which will help us deal with that. Another issue I care very deeply about is China and the emergence of China. And I want to do my best to confront China's unfair trade practices. They're killing jobs in America. They're uh, making it harder for us to be globally competitive. And I want to do everything in my power to finally uh, come to grips with the challenge we face by an emerging superpower named China. And then finally, I want to do everything in my power to help Utah with the particular issues that we, that we face in our state. And I mentioned a couple already. I'll, I'll mention another one that you, you won't be familiar with, but you'll understand how important this is. The Navajo Nation in the, the southeastern corner, uh, corner of our state, uh, they, they have extraordinary water rights. And we in the state would like to have access to that water. And they're saying, look, we'll give you access to our water rights if you'll get some running water to our homes. Because half the homes of Navajo Nation uh, individuals don't even have running water. And so I put together a proposal to say, look, we're going to provide running water to these homes in exchange for the water rights that they'll give to the state. Uh, we're all agreed on that, but it's going to take a lot of work to get that through Congress. So uh, those are the three areas of priority, helping Utah, uh, finally dealing with the excessive spending in Washington, and then confronting China's uh, predatory trade practices. Okay, awesome. Um you know, uh, we, you know, you're, you're constantly seeing on the news complete, um, you know, bipartisanship. I mean, partisanship in D.C. So what would you recommend to really end this political partisanship currently happening in D.C.? Well, I think you're probably going to see partisanship continue. That's all always been uh, part of our American system. Uh, but it's become something more than just partisan. It's become far more bitter uh, and angry. Uh, and, uh, and people are not trusting one another. Uh, they, they see each other with contempt. And uh, uh, we've always had disagreement, and that's the nature of our political system. There have been debates and, and disagreements. Uh, interestingly, among the senators themselves, people get along pretty darn well. As long as the camera is off, we're, we're pretty, uh, pretty cordial with one another and, and work collaboratively. Uh, Republicans and Democrats uh, uh, come together. I mentioned, for instance, the Trust Act, which I'm promoting. I think I have six Democrats that have signed up to sponsor that and six Republicans. So we can, we can work together. Uh, but the public at large has become really divided and in some respects more angry than, than I can recall during my lifetime. I think that's the result in part of media, uh, which is some people watch Fox and see the news from that perspective. Others watch MSNBC or CNN and see a different perspective. And it's it's led to a, a level of contempt and anger that I think is unusual. How to confront that? Well, I can do my part, not to be personally vindictive and attacking of people on the other side of the aisle, as we each can do. And, uh, and then I think that you also need to have leadership that comes from uh, the top of any organization, whether a school, a teacher, uh, a, a college, a, a hospital system, a corporation, a family or the president or a senator, each of us has to do our part to show respect for one another despite our differences. And uh, we, we got a long way to go before we're gonna make that happen. I'm afraid I'm not gonna make that uh, uh, happen all by myself, but I'm longing for a time when the leaders in our country and across our country uh, are willing to, uh, uh, to yield to a higher level of civility and respect for others, even when we disagree. Okay. Awesome. Um, okay, so um, Addie, Addie, um, if you want to turn your mic on, she had a question for you about uh, duties during self-quarantining. Yeah, my question was, how do you still participate in your senatorial duties while you're in self-quarantine? Thanks, Addie. Um, 
the the answer to that is that that uh, by virtue of the new technology that that we're participating in right now, these video conference capabilities, as well as of course just phone messages and texting and emails, uh, the senators are able to be in touch with one another, and in touch with our respective members of our staff, and our staff members are able to be in touch with each other. So there's a lot of communication going on, even though we're not sitting next to each other. And frankly, even when we're in Washington. We don't spend very much time sitting next to each other. Uh, if you see a picture of the, the floor of the Senate, you'll see a senator giving a speech. But what you don't know is that he or she is typically speaking to an empty room or a near empty room because we're mostly in our offices, uh, perhaps watching the speech on TV or perhaps not watching it at all. Uh, the speeches are more made for the public and for C-SPAN than they are for one another. So most of our communication is done, if you will, electronically. And that continues even in the, uh, the condition we're in right now. So whether we're in Salt Lake or whether in Washington, D.C., uh, our communication is done electronically. And that's, uh, that's how we push things forward. We're, today, there are negotiations going on uh, with regards to additional funding to help small business. Uh, that's something that I was on the phone yesterday with Secretary Mnuchin of the Treasury. Uh, and he was laying out what he thinks the deal is. He's worked out with Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats. Uh, we'll probably have another... Uh, conversation today with leadership in uh, uh, in the Senate, and I hope get a chance to vote at four o'clock uh, East Coast time today on that on that measure. Awesome, uh, Joseph Day. You had a question for Senator Romney about um, what has Congress done? Yeah. So uh, my question is, what has Congress done during the epidemic uh, for the epidemic so far? Yeah, thanks, uh, Joseph. Appreciate that. And uh, it, you're, it looks like you're in a crib, but I don't think that's a crib, right? That must be a staircase. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just, it's just a backdrop from my bed. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. Uh, so, so what what has Congress done? What what we have done is uh, one uh, provided for funding to help people stay in jobs, and that's a program called the um, uh, the Payroll Protection Plan. Uh, and, and we put some $300 billion, $350 billion in a program that helps banks give loans to small businesses and the loans will be forgiven if the small businesses keep their employees on the payroll. Uh, we also put $500 billion in a special uh, facility that allows uh, 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 larger companies to go out and get loans so they can keep operating. So for instance, airlines that aren't making any money right now, they're losing a lot of money. They can get loans uh, from this facility to allow the airplanes to keep flying. We also put uh, money to go to states. States are going to see their revenues go down because the, uh, the economic activity is going down. People aren't buying as much. Therefore, sales tax revenues are down. So states, cities, and towns don't have as much money coming in. But they have even greater expenses with, for, for instance, uh, with their first responders. So uh, we put money, uh, about $150 billion going to states, cities and towns. We also put money to hospitals. Interestingly, you'd think the hospitals would be even busier because of COVID-19. But it turns out that hospitals make most of their money, most of their revenue comes in by doing elective surgeries. And uh, we basically ordered the, the hospitals to stop doing elective surgery so they could focus on COVID-19 patients. And so as a result, hospitals aren't getting much revenue these days. So we put some $75 billion to go to hospitals so that they can stay operating during these difficult times. So our job has been to try and help American families. A, a couple more things I'd mentioned. We passed a piece of legislation saying $1,200 should go to each adult. Uh, plus $500 for each uh, uh, dependent at home. That's to give people a little extra cash during these tough times. And if people are unemployed, we increase the unemployment payment by $600 a week. Uh, again, this was all done uh, by members of the Senate and the House uh, and signed by the president. All these things designed to help during this, uh, this critical time. Okay, awesome. Uh, so the next question, I think that really kind of leads into it. Um, was where is this money coming from, Reagan? Do you want to maybe ask that question? Yeah, so um, I'm doing a research paper about this actually, and I was just wondering where the money is coming from for the $2 trillion aid package that you're mentioning for the 
checks each week and plus the five hundred dollars, but also like where the money's coming from for the payroll protection plan and um, with this financial help, how long do you think it will take for the economy to recover? Yeah, good questions. Thank you. Uh, and uh, that's the big question, in my opinion, that we ought to be talking about soon, which is, OK, we're borrowing all this money. And in a crisis like this, I think it's appropriate that we do borrow the money. But uh, but who's going to pay back the borrowing? And uh, th that's something no one's really talking about. Because we borrow the money, typically from other countries, from people who buy U.S. bonds. Sometimes we just print more money as a country, but ultimately uh, that's got to be paid back. So who's going to be paying this back? Well, right now, you are. Your generation is going to get stuck with it because my generation is going to be gone. And you guys are going to get stuck with paying the interest on this debt, just like credit card debt. You'll be paying interest on this debt all your life. That's not fair. That's not appropriate, in my opinion. And so we're going to have to find, in my opinion, a pathway to make sure that my generation pays its fair share to pay back this borrowing. Not only the $22 trillion we already had in debt, but the additional trillions that we're adding to it with our response to COVID-19. How can we go about doing that? Well, growing the economy faster would help. But of course, we're going to have to think about different sources of revenue, meaning taxes, so that we... We have more money to pay back this debt, make sure we're, we're paying our way as we go along. Uh, you ask another question, which is how long is it going to take for this economy to come back? I have to tell you, I've been watching uh, Governor Herbert and Lieutenant Governor Cox pretty carefully, and, um, and they have managed the state's economy pretty well during this difficult time, at least from my perspective. And, and so they haven't imposed a blanket approach to the entire state, but they've recognized that in some of our more rural communities that some economic activity can continue in some of our more uh, densely populated areas, why economic activity has to really be pulled back. And uh, a lot of people are able to work from their home. Uh, they found ways to keep the economy going relatively well despite this, this crisis. So what's going to happen to get out of the crisis? How do we get the economy going back at full speed? I think it's going to be piecemeal. Uh, not one big you know, switch, but instead uh, industry by industry. So we might say, okay, agriculture is going to come back. And then we're going to also have construction come back. And then perhaps after that, retail, not, not restaurants and bars, but retail. And then perhaps a little later, we'll become uh, restaurants, bars, uh, sporting events, and so forth. But when we're going to have all that back depends upon how successful we are in holding down the resurgence of COVID-19. And I think that's very hard to predict. Uh, we really don't know how many people have been exposed to it already and have developed antibodies against it. We're just now beginning to test for antibodies to see who might be resistant to COVID-19. Until we know how many people have been exposed and are resistant, we won't know how open we can get the economy again. But, uh, but I think you're going to see, uh, it, starting in May, a rolling uh, increase in the number of, uh, of economic activities people are told go out, go out and participate in. And by the way, I think older people uh, and people that have underlying health conditions are probably going to stay isolated a little longer than people like the members of the, uh, the class of 2020. You guys are going to be out there more active, I think, than older folks, uh, because those that get the COVID-19 virus that are older uh, have a much higher risk of mortality as a result of, of getting it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Tyson, uh, do you want to maybe ask your questions about should the economy be reopened? Hi, Senator Romney. So I had a question about, um, do you think that the economy should be reopened and potentially be risking more lives or that we should continue to stay locked down and hurt people's financial health a little bit more? Or is there yeah. a balance to be found? Yeah, thank you. I, I'm a, a pro-life uh, citizen of our country. I believe in protecting life, not just for the unborn, but for those that are alive and well. Uh, so the life of our citizens is a very, very high priority for me. And, uh, and I think what we're going to find is as we get additional testing and, uh, and, and contact tracing, that we will be able to prevent uh, COVID-19 from once again running rampant throughout our society. We will allow our hospitals to be able to deal and, and treat those people that get the disease without having them become overwhelmed like we saw in places at some corners of New York and as we saw in Italy and Spain. Uh, and, uh, and so we'll be able to gradually uh, increase our economic activity. 
Does that mean a full board turning the switch? No, it means very gradually, county by county, uh, business by business, age group by age group, uh, and then monitoring very carefully to make sure that we're not creating a new um, uh, spike of, of uh, COVID-19 cases. I, I'm, I'm confident that if we see another spike of some kind, we'll have to pull back a bit. But I think you're going to see us meter out slowly but surely the, re, the restart of our economy. The reason it had to come to a, a screeching halt, of course, is that uh, we just uh, weren't fully prepared uh, for what hit us. And we were unable to contain COVID-19. And so we had to sort of shut everything down to keep our healthcare system from being completely overwhelmed. But now that things that have been, have been shut down for an extensive period of time, and the, the curve of infections has slowed down, hospitalizations have slowed down, actually declined, deaths likewise declining, we're now at a point where I believe it's, it's going to be safe, probably first part of May, to begin slowly but surely metering the reopening of our economy. Okay, awesome. Um, so I think we'll move on to our next question. Uh, Caitlin Hill, you had a question about political environment. Yeah, um, sorry, give me one second. So just like, um, in a political environment with so many agendas, how do you say focus on COVID-19 measures? Yeah, thanks, Caitlin. Um, really, uh, COVID-19 is, is probably the big issue that, uh, that senators and congresspeople are, are focused on right now uh, because it's, it's what we're hearing uh, from our citizens across the state and across the nation. I mean, if you watch the, the news in the morning or the news in the evening, uh, it's probably, I don't know, 80 or 90 percent of the news you're seeing. Uh, you know, someone like uh, uh, Joe Biden uh, becomes the presumptive nominee of the Democratic Party. We hardly even know it uh, because all those kinds of pieces of the news are pushed to the side given COVID-19. Uh, so in some respects, our bigger issue is how do we make sure that we don't forget the other big issues that are that are uh, important to us, uh, our, our deficit issues, our uh, how we're going to deal with China. I'm going to be writing a, a, a piece in a newspaper this week about China uh, and about what we need to do to, to hold them accountable. Uh, these kinds of things, I think, are also important to, to carry on. But I can assure you uh, every amount of, uh, of brain power that can be applied to COVID-19 uh, from members of the House of the Senate is being applied. Now, we may not have as much brain power as the nation would like to see, but what we have, we're going to use as well as we can. <laughs> Thanks, Caitlin. Okay, uh, Callie, did you have a question about the change in the future? Yeah, so my question was, like, how do you think COVID-19 will change the way that the U.S. like lives in the future? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think it's one that, that, that uh, is uh, going to be defined over time, uh, in part by your generation more than mine. But you're going to see a lot more people shopping for groceries online because we've learned how to do it. Uh, you're going to see a huge increase in, uh, uh, in online purchases of all things because we've all done more and more of that and found that it works pretty darn well. Uh, you're probably going to see uh, people much more concerned about air travel. It's going to be a while until we get comfortable with air travel. We're going to really have to have a vaccine of some kind that protects us against COVID-19 before people are going to want to get on uh, uh, airplanes. I think you're going to find uh, companies having fewer company meetings and conferences and trade shows uh, uh, because they're going to recognize, gosh, we get along pretty well with, uh, with Google and with Zoom and, and uh, Microsoft. They've all got ways for us to meet pretty effectively. And maybe we don't need to spend as much money to fly across the country and, and rent hotel rooms and ballrooms and so forth to have our meetings. Uh, so I think you're going to find us to be a lot more online. Uh, I think there'll be a big push in the ride sharing uh, uh, world to move towards autonomous vehicles. Um, people are going to say, you know, I'd rather be in a vehicle by myself than with a driver. And, uh, and I know there's new technology that's being developed there, but there's going to be a real push to do that. And uh, I think there may also be a, a dramatic change uh, in where we source products in this country, meaning uh, medical pr products, uh, pharmaceuticals and medical devices and, and personal protective equipment. We're going to say we no longer want to have that just coming from China. We want to have that coming also from the U.S. 
and what we learn in our medical arena, I think is going to be applied also to other parts of our economy. We're gonna say, wait a second, uh, do we really wanna have our telecommunications equipment all coming from China? Uh, do we wanna have our national security equipment, any portion of it coming from China? Um, I, I think we're gonna finally, I hope we're gonna finally deal with China in a way that dissuades them from their predatory practices and makes them uh, decide that they want to participate in a global economy playing by the same rules the rest of us do. So these, I think, are the kinds of things that are going to be shaped in part by the lessons learned by COVID-19. It was a big wake-up call, I think, for the economy and for national defense. It's also a, a uh, uh, if you will, the new education experience for a lot of our consumers, older people in particular, to say, like you guys are the younger generation, you know what? we can do a lot more things online than we've ever done before. Uh, so I think that's where our economy is gonna head even more aggressively than it already was. Thanks for the question. Okay, uh, I think we really have time for just about one more question. I actually got a question in from another teacher that I wanted to maybe ask you. Um, how is this really going to affect the education system in Utah, Senator Romney? Well, I think you're gonna, uh, and, and you're gonna probably be a better uh, uh, source of giving me an answer to that than I will be. Uh, but, but I think it's uh, it, the, the same uh, measures that I just spoke about uh, with regards to the overall economy are going to apply in education. I think people are going to say, you know what, we can do more online and we can access uh, uh, content and faculty members from, uh, from across the country and from across the state. Uh, we can give our students more, uh, more visibility to, uh, to leaders of different kinds, to thinkers of different kinds. Uh, because they've all become more conversant with how to do a, an online meeting. I mean, I, I haven't done online meetings until this COVID-19 crisis came along, and now I do you know, more than one a day. And uh, I think it's going to change education that way. There will probably be more cyber learning. Uh, I think, I think uh, people will use uh, the uh, electronic vehicles for, for more uh, communication of, 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 uh, of educational content, like uh, Khan Academy will probably grow a great deal. And and, uh, and other online services of that nature. And I think, okay. uh, I, I, you know, I, think, I think you're gonna find it's an exciting time to be an educator and it's an exciting time to be a student because you're gonna have uh, far more involvement with other members to provide you perspective. And your faculty members, instead of just being the source of, of all knowledge and content, they will be, uh, they'll be like ringmasters, bringing in content from all over the country and all over the state and if you will, curating an educating, education experience uh, from a source larger than just their own brain. Awesome, uh, awesome. Yeah, that, that's definitely how I feel sometimes is, is the ringmaster over all of this, but. <laughs> uh, um, well, thank you, Senator Romney. I know you have to go. You've got some meetings coming up soon, but I really appreciate and just wanted to say thank you for this opportunity, you know, for you to come and maybe talk to my class today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Jensen, and thank you to your class. I wish you all a very a successful graduation and the next stage in your career. We're counting on you. Thank you, okay. Mr. Romney. Okay. Have a great day, guys. Thank you.